Without further ado, our next speaker is Mr. Steve Leonard, who is a technology industry leader with a wide range of experience in software, hardware consulting, and managed services. He's the CEO of Singularity University, and prior to his role to Singapore, many would say he knows Singapore better than Singaporeans. He was the CEO of SG Innovate, serving three years as the Executive Deputy Chairman of the Infocom Devel Development Authority as well. And he's today based in the UK and helping to strengthen the links between Singapore as well as the UK. Without further ado, please put your hands together to welcome Mr. Leonard. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and I would love to, I guess my opportunity is to call my fellow panelists up, so uh, if I may, just ask for help with that. Natalie, if you would join me, please, and Jackie and Nick, you are Nick. Okay. <clears throat> okay, uh, we, we will have, uh, I hope, an informal opportunity for discussion, and I'm very thankful and blessed to have worked with both uh, Jackie and Natalie previously and to have come to know Nick. So with that in mind, there's a lot for us to talk about and I hope we'll have a very uh, open discussion. So what, what I'd like to do is let me just frame what I'd like for us to explore today. And here's how I think of it. The brief discussion for us today is really about how accelerating development of technology, tackling hard problems, and the role of public and private partnerships in doing that. And here's how I think of it. First, we need to accelerate the development of new technologies to address global challenges. And I believe that we would all agree that important human needs include sustainably providing equitable access for education, health, energy, housing, food, and much more. These are problems of importance, and they're areas that we need to be working on together. Second, we know that new and current technologies will be the backbone, the foundation for any smart and sustainable city that we imagine. And third, we know that the new technologies and current technologies that will be playing these critical roles must include a high degree of trust between members of any ecosystem and between ecosystems such as Singapore and the UK. With those assumptions, there could not be a more important set of topics for us to explore and a more esteemed and expert panel uh, with whom to explore it. So what I'm going to do is start with uh, my good friend, uh, Jackie, who, of course, is the managing director of the Economic Development Board and has held uh, many roles in Singapore that are important and influential. And in fact, what I'd like to do, Jackie, is start with you. As you take a look at how technology will play a critical role between any government and its citizens, or any government and any corporation, Singapore has really been at the front of exploring these, pursuing these, developing these, and you've played a critical role. How do you think about this on behalf of, of all of us, smart and sustainable cities? Thanks very much, Steve. I think the first thing I'd like to do is to welcome my Deputy Prime Minister, Sreen Kek Sikyat here. Um, <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Uh, in some way, I think that is a sign that, you know, what we are going to say uh, is kosher <laughs> and does represent the government's uh, viewpoint on some of these issues and how we've actually tackled this issue uh, for many years now. I think the things that governments can do to encourage uh, technological innovation and to bring up a startup community that is well-funded, uh, that makes sense and that grows and scales uh, globally uh, there, are th there are four things and four major ingredients, I think, that governments um, can do and that Singapore has tried very hard uh, to accomplish in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. The first is infrastructure. I think only governments can provide the basic infrastructure that make a green economy, a digital economy work. And that could be hard infrastructure, like a national broadband network, a 5G network, a 6G network that supports the growth of the metaverse. It can also be other types of infrastructure, like a national digital identity. Uh, in our case, something called SingPass, uh, that has enabled uh, KYC, Know Your Customer, uh, across a wide range of industries, uh, especially the financial industry, uh, and al allowed that kind of fintech innovation to thrive. So infrastructure is absolutely critical, uh, and I think only governments can effectively provide it in the way that can support innovation. The second thing that only governments can provide is um, progressive regulatory governance. 
that supports innovation while mitigating risk. I think this is uh, you know, something that Singapore has worked very hard to do over the years. Uh, and particularly, you see this in the fintech space where the monetary authority has provided regulatory sandboxes uh, for companies to experiment with fintech solutions and quite successfully made as a fintech hub. Uh, most recently, I think we've been um, named by EC International as um, the most um, attractive uh, startup ecosystem in Asia. And for the first year ever, uh, we've surpassed China as the most, um, most vibrant startup ecosystem. So I think that's really, and, and, and as part of that, I think what was called out was our fintech ecosystem. Um, a lot of this is because of um, progressive uh, regulatory governance. More recently for fintech, I think something called um, Project Guardian has been announced, creating a trusted environment for DeFi solutions, for decentralized finance solutions. Um, the next thing that's quite important, the third, um, is really lead demand. Um, governments play a huge role in creating lead demand for new technologies. Uh, this could be in areas like solar, where HDB many years ago put solar panels on the top of most uh, HDB rooftops. So for those of you, because you're in the Singapore room now, you should know that where 80% of our housing stock is public housing under the Housing and Development Board, and that creates a lot of flat rooftops. Um, and that's how the solar story in Singapore really got a boost, because those rooftops were immediately used for solar power under the Solar Nova program. And companies like Sunseep were able to grow and scale because of that kind of lead demand. But that's the kind of lead demand that we also provide for Smart Nation in terms of the Singapore government buying innovative solutions from companies, the healthcare system buying innovative solutions from, healthcare uh, from other medtech and biotech companies, and then as we move forward, a lot more innovation in the green space. The fourth, of course, and last is financing. I think governments can provide a role in creating a really vibrant financing environment uh, for technologies. Uh, for digital technology, that may involve uh, um, putting seed investments into VC funds or just cr creating an overall environment where you can get VC PE funding, family offices in Singapore being uh, more than 400 to date um, because EDB runs the family office development team with the MAS. Uh, and you know, really having that kind of environment that makes it easy for technologies to get funded. Can I just pick up on one point that I think has been covered here, the role of government and what I know from previous work that uh, I was involved in. One of the most outstanding things that Singapore has done is invest in education. So in addition to regulatory environments and lead demand and financing, all of which are critical, the fact that there is an amazing pool of talent, highly educated, that can go into sciences, into deep tech and build is one of the great differentiators for Singapore. And so if we go to the earliest part of the role of government, education at primary level onward is such a critical part of building a healthy and vibrant ecosystem. And I think it's an area that uh, we should continue to celebrate. Natalie, you're focusing on impactful public and private partnerships across a variety of countries between the United Kingdom and, and many countries across Asia. I know you are especially interested in impactful relationships, not just sort of this is a, a, a good thing to announce. Your work in digital economy, for example, the newest edges of how collaboration between governments and companies uh, can flourish. Can you share a bit more about the work that you're doing and how it creates uh, game-changing outcomes for humanity? Sure, thanks very much, Steve. I mean, that's a big that feels like a lot of pressure on a Monday morning, game changing for humanity, but I, I will give it a go. Um, could I just firstly echo Jackie's um, remarks and Deputy Prime Minister, we're absolutely honoured that you're here for London Tech Week. You're a wonderful friend of the UK. Um, uh, if you thought we had a t there was a good party uh, here in the UK for the Queen's Jubilee, we like to think we threw a pretty good party at Eden Hall, which is the High Commissioner's residence in Singapore, um, only last week. Um, and uh, Deputy Prime Minister graced us there again uh, with his presence um, and provided a, a really thoughtful um, insight into the UK-Singapore relationship. And together with your High Commissioner, TK, we really appreciate the support um, that you give us um, here, but also on a personal note to me back in Singapore. 
Um, as Steve says, uh, I have a regional role. Um, so I'm the UK's Trade Commissioner uh, for Asia Pacific, based in Singapore, which I think tells you something around the regional connectivity that we see from a UK government point of view towards Singapore and of course lots of you uh, from a business side think about that as well and I should say I'm absolutely delighted to see so many UK companies here who I know uh, have operations in Singapore and some uh, friends from Singapore um, uh, who have uh, aspirations for the UK that's exactly the connectivity that we're looking for um, we have over 350 people from Asia Pacific here at London Tech Week, investors and entrepreneurs um, and influencers. Um, of those, 40 are from Singapore. And I think actually looking at this room, I think that number's a bit low. So I'm gonna get someone to uh, double check that. But it just shows you the enth enthusiasm for this week and uh, the high expectations. Um, but let me go back to Steve's question, otherwise I'll whitter on for a while. Um, I think there are a, a three, um, uh, initiatives uh, that we've started and, and grounded in Singapore that have really made um, a difference. Um, first of all is the UK-Singapore Digital Economy Agreement. Um, I know that might not sound the most exciting thing, um, but um, if you your business has anything to do with data, this is something that you need to look at and understand um, because it could be quite a big opportunity for you. This is um, the world's most innovative trade deal at the moment. I'm sure someone will try and catch up uh, with us, um, and that's only a good thing. And what we have tried to do is set the rules for the road of the kind of economy and collaboration we would like to have in the future. So protecting the interests of business and consumers while at the same time supporting a thriving ecosystem. So although this deal is focused on UK and Singapore, we think it says a lot about what is possible in the region and indeed around the world. Um, the second step that we've taken is to launch the Digital Trade Network, which always gets a shout out. Um, this is uh, an initiative to increase our capability on the ground, both in Asia Pacific, but particularly in Singapore and back in the UK to support tech companies that want to scale in the region. Um, I'm just going to embarrass him for a second. He's going to hate me for doing this. But Tom Tilling, if you just raise your hand there. Tom is our DTN lead based in Singapore. If you want to understand what support is available to help you expand in Singapore, please um, obviously chat um, to our great friends at EDB and also connect uh, with Tom. You have the people in the room who can make um, a big difference to you. Um, and I can talk about this for ages, so I'm gonna stop there, apart from saying our great friends um, at Tech Nation uh, collaborate in delivering the digital trade network. Um, and they have a number of initiatives which again can support you out in the region. And finally, uh, two weeks ago, we launched GBX Asia, which is an idea where we stole from our friends on the West Coast. It is um, unashamedly for British people um, who uh, work in the UK tech ecosystem and have uh, an aspiration to be involved in Asia Pacific, launched in Singapore. If you would like to get involved, please speak to any of us. But what we want to do is support and facilitate the ecosystem. So th through those three initiatives, we think we are um, setting the foundation for the aspirations that Steve is talking about. Um, and I'm sure we'll come on to it in a minute, but the areas that I think we, we should particularly focus on is, of course, sustainability and the green economy. And I hope that we'll come back to that in a second. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, Nick, you're involved in an area of emerging uh, technology, crypto. Uh, some people would not understand it well. There's misinformation or disinformation, at a minimum, sometimes a misunderstanding of what this broad statement about crypto means. But there are many positive applications, many positive use cases, and I know that's one of the areas that you especially are thinking about, how this technology can be used as a force for good. Uh, do you want to share a bit about your thoughts about crypto broadly and perhaps about the work that you're leading? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, how do you all do? I'm Nick Charters. I'm the general manager of crypto.com here in the UK. And Deputy Prime Minister, and I say how pleasure it is to be able to talk to you today. Um, I think first thing to say is we're a Singapore headquartered company. Um, uh, our executive team uh, are based there, and I am part of the growing presence in the UK. Um, so it's particularly pertinent, you know, with our with the, the relationships that we have here. Um, I think first let's acknowledge some of the headwinds that are going on in the financial markets. Uh, we're in a crypto bear market. Um, there's, there's nowhere to hide of that. But from my perspective, 
it's important to look at the underlying fundamentals. Um, uh, the principles that this technology is built on haven't changed, uh, and they are phenomenal. Um, and if you look at the underlying user growth and adoption, that is still growing. In fact, the rate of growth is increasing every single day. So last year, let me give you an example. Last year, the user base of crypto is estimated have, to have gone from 100 million to 300 million people. This year, we think it'll be a billion. Right? Um, in that last year, our user base went from 10 million to 50 million people. That's active users. We're quite brutal on the way we, we gauge a user. 50 million active users uh, have joined um, our, our crypto ecosystem. Um, and so the things that I'm perhaps, shall we say, most excited about, perhaps, um, are one, continuing to drive that adoption um, for the new generation of builders and creators uh, of blockchain and Web3. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to provide in our ecosystem. The second thing I'm incredibly excited about is the fundamental change in regulatory sentiment around the world. Okay, and I'll give you some examples of this. A few weeks ago, we had the Financial Conduct Authority do a crypto sprint. 150 industry and regulatory people all got together into a room for two days, um, and the energy was incredible. And we started working out how we could solve some of the fundamental problems around how to regulate crypto. Um, and it's worth me saying that we want regulation. It is a good thing. It builds consumer confidence and it builds trust. Um, and we're very, very much focused about generating that trust. What else has happened? Well, the MAS, you know, one of the most proactive regulators out there and are leading the way in the digital asset space. Um, President Biden announced his executive order back in March, and even our own chancellor um, uh, was very positive on crypto. And that shifted sentiment and allowed us to really start talking about the future and how we deploy these technologies uh, in a positive fashion rather than perhaps some of the negative sentiment that's out there. Um, the last bit I think I'm probably very, very excited about is the future of Web3. I think you know the, the, there's nearly two billion people in the world that are underserved by financial services, and it genuinely has the chance to open that up to a much broader spectrum of people. Financial services are generally expensive at the base level. Some of the technology is very old um, around the world, uh, not in our nations, obviously. Um, uh, and, and we have an opportunity with new technology to deliver these services at a much cheaper price uh, to a much broader spectrum of society. Um, and I think, uh, nod to my colleague Rosie here, uh, is that there are some really cool opportunities in climate change. And I'll give you one example, the tokenization of carbon offsets just gives us a lovely opportunity to solve some of the problems in that sector. Um, and I've absolutely no doubt there's going to be more and more and more in that space. Thank you, Nick. Uh, what I'd like to do is, I don't know whether this is encouraged or however the format is, but I'd like to make sure that we have an opportunity for a question or two from anyone in the room from uh, or to these three leaders. So I'll make sure I leave a little space for that. Nick has brought us into the metaverse. Uh, so let's explore for a little bit. And I think the point you're making about tokenization is a very important point because education and understanding of how these technologies can be thoughtfully used to distinguish from misuse. Because when you think about CDOs and derivatives and what they did to the US markets, and so not allowing the fever to overwhelm the goodness, uh, I think is going to be a big function of, uh, of education. Jackie, in terms of uh, the work that you've done, have led, uh, continue to be involved in around Singapore as a vibrant economy, how do you think of the metaverse? Again, some people think of it as, you know, there's virtual land and I can buy a space next to Jay-Z. And so how do you think about the metaverse <laughs> as a way of bringing people together? We saw creative artists who now have the chance to participate in the value of the work that they create. Um, how can the metaverse play a positive role? And what should government do or not do as it evolves? Thanks. I, I, I suppose at first, 
answer the question how much I think about metaverse <laughs> at all. Um, I think one of the things I do think about the metaverse is that it's quite different from Web3. They're not the same concept, and it's, it's very important that people understand that the kinds of companies uh, or sectors you, in, you invest in for one are not the same as the ones you invest in for the other. So for the metaverse, I think it's increasingly becoming a multi-metaverse, but also a much more centralized uh, picture uh, that involves a lot of AR, mixed reality, and so on. Um, that's going to be growing out in the possibly in the next 10 years uh, in, in alliance with a number of tech hardware manufacturers that are working very hard on headsets, sensors, and, 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 and um, innovations in that space. So there's a bunch of software involved in the metaverse um, that is very much currently, um, I think, very much centered on the gaming industry. And likelihood is that between gaming and 5G, mobile gaming, and the, the tech hardware players, that's where the uh, bulk of investment opportunities in the metaverse are going to be. Now, Web3 is a bit different, and it's not even crypto. So again, uh, there's a lot of focus on um, crypto exchanges, you know, um, how, how real are private cryptocurrencies, um, how, uh, you know, should, should we allow everyone to invest in them because they can be very volatile and, and retail investor protection is required, but then where is the future for that? That's a lot of where the focus has been, but uh, to be very honest, um, uh, Web3 is bigger than, well, actually, crypto is bigger than crypto exchanges, Web3 is a concept bigger than crypto, and blockchain is sort of bigger than Web3. <laughs> so, so I think, again, where we're thinking about where it's helpful to invest in this space, something that's very likely to um, have a real role to play in our technology landscape and transactions landscape years into the future, we have to sort of really uh, disaggregate out where we think the fundamental technologies and use cases are going to lie and where they are, more importantly, um, beneficial as decentralized rather than centralized functions. Because I think there are a lot of things that can be done on centralized ledgers uh, that don't need to be decentralized. But there are a few things that a decentralized ledger and the power of blockchain and Web3 can accelerate. So I think we're being very circumspect about what it means to build digital asset capabilities in Singapore and what it means to manage risk while encouraging innovation. Now, there happens to be a little nexus in between Web3 and the metaverse, which has a lot to do with making um, transactions in gaming. <laughs> Um, and a lot of tokenization is taking place around, you know, objects in games, uh, whether they can be transferable and how that is, in fact, monetized. And that's where the nexus actually resides. There's actually quite a lot of interesting developments in that space, and I would say that it might be an interesting uh, investable opportunity going forward as well. But I think what's quite critical is not to mix up the metaverse, Web3, and where the concepts are actually... Um, uh, collide. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Natalie, we touched briefly, I know you'd like to discuss it more, climate, sustainability, uh, this whole concept that every single thing we do, not just recycling, but how do we produce, how do we try to consume differently. When you think about partnerships, how do you think about the construct of partnerships through a lens of improving societies and planets as opposed to the sort of transactional nature of, you know, this is good for this company or this marketplace or this uh, relatively modest group of people. How do you think of partnerships at the broadest level in the work that you do? Because when you think about climate and sustainability, sometimes it feels fuzzy and it's hard to really think about it in a tangible way. Are there examples of where you think uh, collaboration is occurring that will have a measurable, meaningful effect on carbon or water or food? Thanks, Stephen. A really great question. And actually, I think a really important one, um, because even though, you know, going back to what Nick was alluding to in terms of the economic situation we now find ourselves, um, I don't think the net zero debate and particularly the sustainability debate is going to go away. In fact, it's actually going to become more important. 
Um, and it's not that this is a, a nice to have. Um, actually, uh, more often than not, it's n not just economically essential, that from an investment point of view, it's actually something that's going to um, drive ecosystems around the world. Those that lead in this debate um, will be the leaders for the next um, 10, 20, 30 years. Um, so I think that's why you are seeing so much in political investment, and obviously we've done that here from the UK as chairs of COP26 jointly with our friends in Italy, um, but also the business leadership you particularly see in Singapore, actually. I'm always so impressed with how many business leaders th uh, that I meet that this is the first area that they want to talk about. And it's not a nice to have, it's not paying lip service, it's a serious issue at the board level all the way through. Um, and there's a lot that we can uh, learn from that. In practice, what is the opportunity? So we know that even for at least 40% of um, the carbon reduction that we need to make in order to meet uh, the net zero targets, that that technology is not available at a mass level in the market today. So there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done globally to catch up. Now, of course, Steve, you're kind of alluding to the fact that this is a bit overwhelming, right? Where do you start? Um, and I think you know that's really where the, the tech community comes in because uh, you guys are so strong at s solving problems and spotting opportunities. Um, and just to give Tech Nation another shout out, um, I'll be getting my credit later on, um, they've got a brilliant net zero program uh, which is closing at the end of June. Um, so if you are a scale up in this space and you're looking for opportunities, please do um, check it out. Um, so you have that, I think, at uh, a sort of scaling um, end of the business. Pretty much all new exciting entrepreneurs that you meet at the moment, you know, young bright things, I remember being one of those, um, they, they, are, they want to get into sustainability. That's where they see the opportunity and that gives me a lot of hope. But then at the other end of the spectrum, the big corporates that I was alluding to, they are also spending the time. Um, I've just had the pleasure of being at um, Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore and talking to uh, a number of British corporates who are investing in Singapore um, on sustainable aviation fuel. If we crack that problem, I will not feel so guilty about getting on a plane so often, <laughs> number one. Uh, but it's those kinds of strategic interventions that when government and business team up, will actually be able to uh, address this slightly overwhelming problem. So Steve, is, you know, your question was about partnerships. What do they look like? I think it has to be across the spectrum. You know, it's maybe crass to say, but everyone does have a part to play. I think there's really exciting um, opportunities at the startup angle, and that's what you're seeing in the pipeline in terms of the companies coming through, and I can spot a couple of you here in the room, but all the way through to corporates, um, People are playing their part, they are willing to think differently, but we do have to have a longer term view. This is not going to be fixed overnight, it's that long term industrial investment that we need to see across the board. And I do think that's happening, which is making me more optimistic. Thanks, Natalie. And Nick, uh, Natalie opened the door for us on sustainability and climate. One of the statements often made about crypto is mining. And this idea that uh, there's you know, huge amounts of energy and electricity, but there are also new protocols, new approaches, which are less energy intensive. There's proof of stake and proof of ownership, lots of different scenarios. Not asking you to comment on any one platform, but from a trend perspective, do you think that crypto and production of uh, crypto coin in this particular case will become less and less and less a poster child for a uh, climate change problem. H how do you see the trend moving? Thank you for that. <laughs> um, I'm absolutely captivated by the break dancer NFT up there. <laughs> <laughs> nice distraction. <laughs> no, I, th I think that um, it, it, you're right in, in many respects, but th th there are some um, uh, colliding headlines there that make a, a nice bit of noise. You know, Bitcoin, mining, carbon, you know, when you stick them all together. Um, I, I think what we should be looking at is perhaps the comparison with some of the traditional financial services and mechanisms um, and where we can use this emerging technology to substitute and actually provide lower carbon technology solutions. So yes, um, uh, mining has its poster child for that, but as you've rightly pointed out, 
um, that's changing dramatically. We are talking about brand new technology. Um, and each time we go through an iteration uh, and, and new technology is developed, it becomes better and better and better. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. Uh, yesterday, it might have been uh, it might have been a bit of a poster. To tomorrow, it'll be a different conversation, and it probably won't be that relevant. Well, and hopefully a poster for positive engagement. And I think that's one of the important points for discussions like this. There is no way for us to think about future of societies and future of smart cities and so on without tackling some of these somewhat awkward points and then saying, okay, it is what it is, let's move forward. Uh, and if I may, thank the Deputy Prime Minister for your sponsorship and encouragement of Deep Tech in Singapore, because I remember very well several years ago in which you gave a statement, made a statement, talking about all of the money invested by Singapore in research and the fact that now there was an opportunity for us to really see something from it, economic value, societal value, and I'm very thankful for that, uh, for that encouragement. So what I'd like to do in the sort of three minutes that we have May I go to the crowd, to the audience, and just see on this esteemed panel, uh, are there questions that we can tackle for you? I have no particular order, but yes, yes, please. And if I could ask you, please, just because there are several hands up, if we could be crisp. Thank you. Yes, uh, and, and uh, my name is Timo. I'm co-founder of NextGen Foods, food tech startup from, from Singapore, actually. And uh, uh, thank you, first of all, to really Singapore, because uh, as German founder, I found my first business in Germany. I know how it is without any government support. In Singapore, we got uh, seed investment from EDB, from Temasek, and all. They built an R&D center where we are part of. We have production there. And um, so it's really a good example of how it can be if there is a good partnership. And obviously now we're coming to the UK, so I will contact you, Natalie, uh, to team up. And uh, maybe a little bit of a challenging question as well for you, because or for, for, for Jackie, for, for EDB. Um, so there's a lot of education needed for the consumer uh, adaption, right? And, and uh, there is investment for product capacity and teams and everything. And now it's about consumer. So would there be uh, like the idea, or how, what do you think about like really driving more consumer demand by guidelines for restaurants and, and, and you know, schools to uh, have a more plant-based diet? <laughs> <laughs> I've always told my children to eat up their vegetables. <laughs> And now I'm quite happy to tell them, especially in the situation that we're currently in in Singapore, to eat up their plant-based chicken. <laughs> plant-based chicken rice. <laughs> it's, it's very, very timely <laughs> uh, that Timo and his company, Tyndall, have actually brought this to the market and are about to uh, deploy at scale and manufacture at scale in Singapore. Um, I think that our 30 by 30 uh, food vision, uh, in terms of just being more food resilient, and independent in terms of our supplies of our um, nutrients is actually going to be a pretty important uh, f uh, feature uh, of what Singapore needs going forward uh, in terms of its overall resilient story. Um, I'm really appreciative of the companies that have actually taken this journey with us um, and actually grown our agri-tech and agri-food landscape, particularly in alternative proteins. The truth is that um, a lot of companies and a lot of venture capital has gone into building a market that did not previously exist and really creating a customer that did, was not previously there and almost creating a category that was not there before. The big challenge of the market going forward is now that more people are actually aware of what plant-based means or aware of uh, alternative proteins, how does that scale? And who is able to best capture the value that has been created by that entire generation of venture capital that went into educating the market uh, in this. Uh, I can't uh, speak on behalf of my health promotion colleagues or my Ministry of Education colleagues as to what they'll put into schools <laughs> uh, and diets, um, but I can say that it is really important uh, for us to work together in partnership. Uh, you know, during this really important, not the zero to one phase, but the one to 10 phase on where this goes uh, and how it makes sense uh, for, for for the alternative protein landscape to really reach a point where it is accepted as a part of diets uh, and not as a novelty. Thanks, Jackie. I mean, it's a, a very timely question, Timo, and I've uh, watched um, your development in Singapore. Um, you guys have done amazingly well, and it's brilliant to have you here in the UK now. 
Um, in the UK today, we're actually launching um, our, our new food strategy, um, which doesn't actually touch on um, this in maybe the ways that you would hope, but I think it shows how food has obviously skyrocketed to the top of the agenda. Um, and again, going back to Shangri-La, which I was at the weekend, you know, that in theory is a defense conference, um, but everyone was talking about food security. Um, so again, when it comes to tech and the value of solving a problem, I think what you're doing is front and center of that um, and does uh, provide quite a moment to make the most of. Um, I was just in Marks and Spencers yesterday and I was impressed with the range of plant-based offerings now, right? It's a given. You go into a, a supermarket and that's what you expect to see. So that's really fantastic. Um, but um, it all, you know, that doesn't do away with the fact that we've still got a food waste problem. Um, and I'm really proud of the company Olio. If you haven't seen them, look them up. Um, they're one of Tech Nation's cohorts. Sam, I think that's a third mention. I've got you for Tech Nation there. Uh, I'm doing well. Um, but they came through um, Tech Nation's accelerator program, have now launched in Singapore uh, with a partnership with Food Panda. Um, so I think when we look at food strategy overall, it has to be about building a more sustainable model, which I think that is what you guys are doing, and for um, government to support you in that um, and be receptive to the feedback of how we need to learn, because this is a new market, as Jackie was saying. But we also can't ignore the problems of today. Um, and I do think that's where waste comes in, and that's where there are also other opportunities that we need to be backing. I'm going to have to uh, wrap. I apologize for those that uh, I didn't get to. Uh, but what I'd like to do is just summarize with, we know that technology must continue to accelerate and develop, and we know that these will be learning experiences. Some will work well, some may not work as well, but it's uh, uh, evolving. Trust must remain high for adoption. Smart and sustainable cities are key to all of our collective future. We're excited about the work that Singapore is doing. We're excited about the work that the United Kingdom is doing. And the collaboration between the two is uh, much more than just the simple combination. It's exponential. So from that perspective, thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, HICOM. Many different uh, dignitaries here today to be a part of this. Thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you to my panel. Let's get going. Thank you.